Hi, ladies and gents. I'm Henrik, and this is Red Ice Radio with headquarters in Sweden and in North America. If you're new to the program, take a look at redice.tv for more radio shows, news, videos, and excerpts from our live TV show. Today, we're talking about the history of Islam and the life of Muhammad. Our guest is Dr. Bill Warner from politicalislam.com. Bill holds a PhD in physics and math from North Carolina State University. He's been a university professor, businessman, and applied physicist. Now, Dr. Warner has had a lifelong interest in religion and its effects on history. He studied the source texts of the major religions for decades. Now, if you're a regular listener of the show, you might not agree with uh, you know Bill's views on 9-11 or some of the things such as who lobbies to open the borders or controls the school textbooks, etc. But the history part is a very interesting aspect that I think is very important to consider. So, uh, as usual, please don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. You have officially received a trigger warning. I mean, from our globalist friends and the mainstream media who back them, it's clear that with increasing immigration, we are not being told the truth about the history between Islam and Europe. You know, there were hundreds and hundreds of attacks on Europe before the Crusades were brought together. And they're telling us that this is a religion of peace, while we see terrorism, both on a large scale, but also on a very small scale, individual attacks. All of this is on the rise around in the countries that have open borders, and they're asking you to perform the noble task of double think and ignore this reality in front of you. So we are going to talk about the history of this today and help you get some of the terms defined, such as Sharia, Jihad, the Jiza, the Sunnah, and much more. So stay tuned. I hope you get something out of this discussion. Welcome, Dr. Bill Warner. Thank you so much for coming on with us. It's a pleasure to have you here. Delighted to be here. Well, this is great. You know, we, we discuss a lot on the show about the problem with, uh, with Islam, particularly in Europe, but also in America. We discuss the, the attacks, the consequences of having open borders and, and not checking first and foremost who is coming in, uh, as, as is occurring now during the, the so-called migrant crisis. But one of the things that I do want to try to get closer to today and, and kind of when we have you here to, to pick your brain, really, because we have so much knowledge about this, is to get to the origin point of, of Islam. We don't get too much opportunity to discuss this. So out the gates here, maybe you can tell us a bit about the life of Muhammad, what you know about this, I guess what we know academically about this, and how all of this mess that we find ourselves in today, how this got started. Well, let's establish that there are two Muhammads. There is Muhammad whose biography we know in the Sirah and whose acts and deeds we know in the Hadith. So there's that Muhammad. Then there is a historical Muhammad, and all of a sudden, if we deal with historical Muhammad, Muhammad, we're on very shaky grounds, because it turns out that his biography was written about roughly 150 years after he died. So let's not deal with the aspect of the historical Muhammad, but instead let's deal with the, shall I say, the accepted Muhammad, the one that every Muslim believes in. And if we have, you'll notice we're talking there about Muhammad, not Allah, but all the basis we need to know about Islam is found in the statement of the Shahada, which is there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. That tells us that we need to study Allah, which is the Quran. Now, oddly enough, when we study the Quran, which is where the average person thinks Islam is found, we discover that there's not enough in the Quran to be a Muslim. I mean, you cannot be a Muslim because not a single one of the five pillars of Islam is found in its entirety in how to do it in the Quran. But... The Quran gives us a way out, and that way out is found in the fact that there are 91 verses in the Quran which state that Muhammad, she is the perfect pattern for all people, and that all men are to follow, and women are to follow him in every way into the smallest detail. So even the Quran takes and points to Muhammad. And so he, if we're going to understand Muhammad, to understand Islam, we need to understand Muhammad. Now yeah. this is good news. Because the Quran is famous for not being able to be read or understood. But Muhammad, we've got a man. He has a history, a personal life. We can understand that he gets hungry. We can understand that he has sex. We can understand he becomes angry. So we're dealing with someone we can well understand. Now, having said that, we need to first examine Muhammad's life and see that it, his life as a prophet breaks down into two separate, different people. He preached the religion of Islam in Mecca for 13 years and persuaded roughly 150 Arabs to become Muslims, about 10 a year. He left Mecca at the insistence of the Meccans. They actually ran him out of town. And when he went to Medina, 
So Muhammad was driven out of Mecca. He didn't leave on his own. And when he went to Mecca, he transformed into a politician and a jihadist. Now, this is not something that I'm making up or it's some sort of slander or a put down. This is clearly, clearly recorded in the Sirah, the life of Muhammad. Now, here's what's important. He was involved in many assassinations. As a matter of fact, he had roughly, an, a, he, there was roughly a jihad event on the average of about every five to six weeks for the last nine years of his life. But by the practice of jihad and politics, he became completely saturated. They, everyone in the area around the central Arabia became a Muslim. So we have here the preacher who was a failure, but the politician jihadist was an absolute success. So therefore we get an insight then into Islam. It is the religion of peace and it is the politics of jihad. Why do we know this? Because that's what Muhammad's life is like. And there are 91 verses in the Quran which say that his life is to be endlessly repeated until every human being becomes a Muslim. Amazing. But what do we know about, obviously we know in Persia you had Zor Zoroastrianism, mm -hmm. but, in, but in the area that he was, uh, you know, early in his life, what kind of religion, was there a religion there that we know of? Pa just there were pagans, I guess, <laughs> believed in multiple well, gods? Well, there, there were pagans. Well, from the Sarah, we learn all this information. <clears throat> We learned that, for instance, there were pagans, uh, and then there were Jews, and there were Christians. Now, in the town of Medina, we have reference to Christians. As a matter of fact, there's a Christian slave who appears in the Quran, in which it is said, we know that they're saying that you get your information from this man who is not an Arab, but this, era, this Quran is written in perfect Arabic. Well, Muhammad used to spend a lot of time talking to a Christian slave in the marketplace, and so the Meccan said, ah, oh, see, he's getting this stuff from them. So know from the Sirah that there were references to Christians, but mostly pagans. Now, interestingly enough, the pay were polytheist pagans, and there were, it was said, 360 different religions that were found in the Kaaba. That is the central temple or the central spiritual site within Mecca. 360 religions were found there. The point is, is that polytheists are inherently tolerant. So we know that there were many tolerant pagans or polytheists in Mecca. We know there were some Christians, but we know that there weren't any Jews. How do we know that? Because when you read the Quran written in Mecca, and there are two Qurans that match his life, there's the early Quran written in Mecca and the latter Quran written in Medina, and they're very different books. When we read the early Quran written in Mecca, we find that it retells all of the stories of the Jews, but they're slightly changed. The story of Noah and Moses and Adam are all retold to point out that if you do not believe the prophet of Allah, you will be destroyed. Now, here's what happened about him and the Jews in Arabia, which was this. When he went to Mac Medina, the town was half Jewish. The Jews look at Muhammad, who claimed to be the prophet in the same prophetic lineage as the Jewish prophets, and said, you are no prophet in the Jewish lineage. Well, no one told Muhammad no, at least permanently. Two years later, Medina was Judenrein, cleansed of Jews. The three Jewish tribes were exiled, annihilated, enslaved, and assassinated. So, Therefore, I'm giving you the question was, what about the religions of, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula? And what we find is, if we read the Sirah, we find that there were some Christians, there were some Jews, and there were many polytheists. Now then, briefly, in the early Quran, Mecca, the Jews are well spoken of. But in Medina, once they told him that he was not the prophet, not at least of their lineage, the, told, the whole tone became, changes. And indeed, the Quran written in Medina is viciously Jew hatred. I've read Mein Kampf, and indeed there's more Jew hatred in the Quran written in Medina than there is in Mein Kampf. It's both, it's just <laughs> much worse, both in quantity and quality. So that's interesting. So something happened. Do you know if he actually was born of a Jewish mother? So was he uh, technically Jewish? You know, I don't know about that. Can't speak. All right, interesting. Well, let me ask you a bit more of what actually, what happened. And why, I mean, I, I'm not saying that the religion, religion was accepted. We're talking about force here, but you're saying he converted about 10 people a year, right? We're talking about an enclave of, of about 150 people 
in the beginning. Yes. How how did this expand? How did this explode? Well, the expansion it? came. <laughs> the expansion comes. And by the way, this story of Muhammad should be made into a movie. Uh, it, it is a fascinating story, and I'm not being ironic. The man is born and is born becomes an orphan, and rises up to being the first ruler of a United Arabia. I mean, it's a fabulous story, but unfortunately, it's not well known. And why did we go from 150 to total saturation that it was every Arab becomes a Muslim? Because he had a new method in which you could worship a God and make money. You see, for a long time, for the first year when Muhammad was in Mecca, the Muslims were very poor. Now, he had a score to settle in Mecca. Number one, they had thrown him out of town and made him look bad. They humiliated him. And the other was they had money and he had none. Now, remember. Muhammad made his money as a caravan superintendent. That is, he knew the caravan trade. So he raided after, it took eight tries to get it, but he became successful when he raided one of the caravans uh, from Mecca. Now then, 80% of the booty went to the raiders. 20% went to Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Well, now then he had a religion with a politics that paid money, good money, big money. And so... As Osama bin Laden said, people love a strong horse. Well, all of a sudden, Muhammad became a strong horse, and he became attracted more people. His violence also attracted people. Now, this is hard for people to understand, but in America, after 9-11, September 11, 2001, the attack on the World Trade Centers, many people converted to Islam. Let me tell you a small story that comes from the Sirah, the life of Muhammad. Muhammad, and I forget at which stage this of cleaning out the Jews, said, kill every Jew you can lay your hands on. And this one man killed his business partner. And his brother approached him and says, how can you have done this? You have killed the man who put the fat on your belly. He said, Muhammad said to kill him. The brother looked at the other brother and said, you mean if Muhammad said to kill me, you would kill me? He said, yes, I would. The brother said, this is a marvelous thing. I must become a Muslim. So here, the fact that his brother would kill him was an indication of he wanted to become a Muslim too. So this had to do, so the success was political power, prestige, being a winner is always a good thing, and money was to be made. So this became a very successful piece of business, and it was indeed business. Muhammad made jihad a business. Interesting. So we have a situation here where it, where it expands, I mean, incredibly rapidly. I don't know if we've seen anything like it. Can you kind of give us an overview of, of how it expands in, in what direction? And because you did a couple of presentations on basically the, on the classical world and mm -hmm. in a very similar situation, I have to say, uh, almost after like today, like after the Second World War, the way we have been weakened and, and, and now we're seeing a, a change in, in the demographics in Europe, particularly. But at the time, uh, there was massive battles between the, the Greeks and the Persians, and this seemed to have weakened them at that time. Yes. And that's when they strike and move in. Tell us more about that. Well, first off, it was established that Muhammad was successful through jihad. It was jihad that made him successful. Now, by the way, just a brief sidebar, and we can deal more with this later. Jihad is practiced with the sword. It is practiced with the mouth, the pen, and money. So any, you can advance the cause of Islam through jihad, but not just by killing people. So, Muhammad was successful, and once he had conquered, if you will, all of the tribes around Medina, he then struck out north to go into Syria. Now, this was not the first time that he had left Medina to seek out people to, to conquer. He had done this before with the Jews of Kaibar. But anyway, after, so after Muhammad has crushed the Jews and the pagans, he then goes north into Syria. Now, what happens is soon after this, Muhammad dies, but he has already demonstrated his power for expansion. The fact is every knee must bend and every mouth must say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. So therefore, when Muhammad died, the first person who became caliph, and you can think of caliph as a ruler, which is like a pope, king. That's a rough analogy, but it's a spiritual leader and a religious and a political leader. We currently have a caliph again today, of course, in Islamic State. But the first caliph was named Abu Bakr, and he was Muhammad's closest companion and was his father-in-law. 
Now, the first thing that happened when Muhammad died was, is that there were many people who said, you know, it was kind of nice being a Muslim. We've liked working with Muhammad, but Muhammad is dead now. So we're on our way. Goodbye. Thank you a lot. And, uh, Abu Bakr said, no, 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 you're a Muslim. No one ever leaves being a Muslim. And the Rita wars or the apostasy wars were fought. What happened was, is that the military might crushed all of those Arabians who wanted to cease being a Muslim. After that happened for a while, the rest of the Muslims said, you know, we've thought about it and we rather, we really rather like being Muslims. And so therefore we're just going to let the whole issue die. We were, we're now Muslims and there's no more fighting to be done. Then Abu Bakr turned his attention to Syria. Now, soon after this, he dies. He is succeeded by the caliph by Umar. And under Umar, we see a massive explosion of Islam into the Middle East and in North Africa. It was an incredibly rapid expansion, also into Persia. And all of these fell. Now, there were reasons for their falling, but one of which was that both the, the Greeks the Byzantines, as we call them now, but really they were the, what they call themselves were the, was the Romans. They had been fighting the Persians since for a long time. So both sides were weakened, and so they were easy to crush. Now then, this, this power is consolidated, but we have to understand that what happens is that the heart of the Middle East, Damascus was the intellectual powerhouse of the Christian community. It was taken. And now then, all of these Christians were now under the rule of Islam, and they became dhimmis, D-H-I-M-M-I-S, which were people who could live within Islam. This is the tolerance of Islam. They could live within Islam, but they couldn't practice their religion openly. And at first, of course, they ran the empire for the Muslims, because remember, when they came out of the desert, the first book written in classical Arabic was the Quran. So these were not skilled men. Their architecture consisted of mud brick. So all of the grandeur and glory of the Middle East and the Greek and Persian culture was taken over by them and run by them by the Persians and Christians who became dhimmis and ran the empire for them, collected taxes and gave them the money. So they didn't kill them all, but they did set into the place the Sharia, which means that the Christians could be humiliated. The Jews could be humiliated and the Zoroastrians could be humiliated as well as taxed. So they became high class slaves or third class citizens, except the third class citizens business. They weren't really citizens. They couldn't testify in court. There were many obstructions to uh, being a full. They were subjects. So that's a brief story about the military expansion of Islam. Now, what's interesting here is, is that it never falls back. What do you mean? That is once. That is, here's something to notice about Islam. There are post-communist societies. There are post-Nazi societies. But you don't really find post-Islamic societies, except with a possible place in Spain where they fought for 700 years to throw them out. Right. This is a very interesting thing about Islam, is that once it conquers, it stays conquered by and large. And there's a reason for that. Tell us. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> that question is they become dimmies and they are humiliated. They're humiliated about their social status. If you're a dimmy and your daughter is raped by a Muslim, you can't go to the police and complain about it. You're not allowed to testify in court. So a constant process of humiliation and degradation goes on. So the tolerance of Islam means that a Christian or a Jew or a Zoroastrian can never have a, be a boss over a Muslim. It means if they're insulted, they can't return the insult. If you, throw, if, you, if you throw rocks at a Christian or a Jew, he can't throw rocks back, nor can he even complain. There's a humiliation. And the reason that the demi is humiliated is this. Slaves are to be treated well. Demis are to be humiliated. And this, there is a way out of slavery. You simply convert. And there's a way out of being a demi as well. You convert. So what happens is if you stop being a Christian or a Jew or a Zoroastrian or a pagan, then what happens is, is that you become wealthy and you can have power and you can also have more sex because as a Muslim, you're now allowed to take sex slaves. So the process of a grinding humiliation turns a country like Turkey, which was originally Greek. It was called Anatolia and it became 
it went from being 100% Christian to it's, now it's 99.7% Muslim, and the number of Christians, which is 0.7%, is falling. Right. So it is the Sharia that causes societies to collapse. It is the jihad that puts the Sharia in place. This is the reason why we need to pay attention to the Sharia. And this is the reason, now the Sharia expands across so many fronts, and we're seeing it in, in America today. That is, well, should a woman be allowed to have a niqab, a face covering? Well, you know, it's their religious law. Therefore, they get, when all of these things that are happening are all a process of implementing the Sharia. Here in Tennessee, for instance, the textbooks now in the seventh grade teach what a wonderful thing Islam is. Why? Because the textbooks are becoming subject to the Sharia. Do they have that level of political influence already? Oh, they're in place now. No, no, no. Uh, th here's an interesting story. The textbooks in Tennessee are now becoming Islamicized. And there are many reasons for this. Number one, there's no pushback much locally. But the other is this. Islam has a desire to win. We have a desire to get along. 25 years ago in California... The Muslim Brotherhood met with Qurashi, a billionaire Pakistani, and they decided that one of the ways to practice jihad was to take over the education system in America. To that end, they decided to start taking over the textbook companies, not just with money, but with political and PC, politically correct influence. That is, oh, we're the poor victims. We need to get our story told. So now then textbook companies have an imam on staff or at least to reference themselves to in order to make sure that the story about Islam is always told in a way that is favorable to Islam. So therefore, in the Tennessee textbooks now, the golden age of Islam is portrayed as the high point of human history. Islam is the religion of tolerance because they let Jews and Christians live within their bounds as demis, but still they got to live there. So what we have here is long-term planning with jihad of money and the jihad of influence. So what we're seeing here is, and by the way, this will start happening in Europe too. Oh yeah, it's already, start, it's already happening in Europe. So anyway, so, but this is an example of how Islam wins because they have long-term plans that can go for decades. You see, we, the Kafirs, K-A-F-I-R-S, the non-believers, we keep time with a watch. They keep time with a calendar. There's a big difference. They're infinitely patient, and we need to get this done now. Yeah, interesting. There, there, there are several points here of, that you, of what you mentioned that we should kind of break down and discuss a bit further. Uh, I mean, I, I, I know that there's a lot of everything from open border advocates to white liberals and progressives and other organizations, other groups, and uh, they're kind of aiding and, and helping along in all of this too. But um, one of the things which I think is important to kind of communicate to people is that it's a complete system of life, right? That this is an instruction yes. we have. While we may be in the West, we have doubt, uh, reformation, scientific inquiry, a lot of these other aspects to it, which kind of slowly, whether people like that or not, have eroded our, our faith and our religions and these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's very different within, within Islam, right? Totally different. The only people who call Islam a religion are non-Muslims, Kafirs. At least the Muslims I know will tell you that Islam is a complete way of life. I like to put it as it's a complete civilization. Now, it is a civilization which on the surface is similar to ours, but on closer examination does not have any similarity at all. There is a Latin term, which I don't get to use much, sui generis, and what it means, a thing unto itself. So Islam is a thing unto itself, but it's a complete civilization. Let me contrast the two civilizations. I live in a civilization that, in, in a meta-civilization, which has two cornerstones, the golden rule for ethics and critical thought for um, intellectual thought. Islam does not have a golden rule. A Muslim is to treat another Muslim nicely, but the non-Muslim, the Kafir, can be treated well, or he can be deceived, or he can be anything. So therefore, there's the ethical cornerstone of the golden rule does not exist in Islam, and critical thought is forbidden because no thought is allowed that will contradict the Quran or the life of Muhammad. So therefore, it is a civilization which is supremacist, and it has long-term goals, it has a plan which has been laid out, and the Muslim Brotherhood, by the way, implements these plans in great detail, 
Have you ever seen any of the Muslim Brotherhood documents that came from the uh, the Muslim Brotherhood memo they raid in uh, Virginia? I don't believe I uh, saw that. No, it goes on for pages, and it includes everything that you can, every aspect you can think of a civilization. It's here's how we're going to Islamicize it. So they do long range planning. They have goal they, since it's a civilization. They advance across all fronts. Halal food is a way to advance it. Uh, textbooks are a way to advance it. The jihad of the sword is the only favor we get from Islam. It's the jihad of speech, money, and, the, and writing that's the far more deleterious effect. Interesting. So here's where we get political Islam from as well, right? That it goes outside yes. of the bound of being uh, a religion and starts being a political organization of sorts. And it manifests in two ways. The political part means that the politics of the nation should be run by Sharia. And the other is, is that the kafir is to be subjugated. So it, it works, it works really well. Uh, the kafirs in here in America are, are willing to be subjugated as long as you don't call them bigot, hater, racist, Islamophobe. Right. So yeah. it, it works. Their method of expansion works extremely well. It's proven over time. And the thing that's so frustrating, Eric, is that once you or Henrik, I'm sorry, once you know their how the plan works, it's easy enough to stop. But people don't want to accommodate themselves to fight because if they do, you're a racist, hater, bigot, Islamophobe. So, yeah, uh, that and that, by true. the way, it is astounding how just simply calling someone a racist is enough to shut them up. It's, it's, I, gotten, I, them, I, it's, it's gotten them very far, hasn't it? <laughs> yes, it has. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. And by the way, yeah. when I, if I'm ever debating with a Muslim, I always say I'm a racist, a hater, a bigot, and an Islamophobe. Let's get that out of the way. I'm also a kafir, which includes all of those. Right. Yeah. I'm writing, I'm, I'm going to be issuing a new book, and it's, uh, I'm doing the literary thing of going all my newsletters and articles that I've written over the last uh, eight years. And the title of the book is going to be called Racist, hater, bigot, Islamophobe. Might as well just get it all out there right away. Huh? Hey, get it all out yeah. there now. We've dealt with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's fun. It is funny. I mean, technically, though, from a from a technical standpoint, in terms of what the some of the terms mean there, uh, at least if we just talk about racism, I mean, it, being a, a Muslim is not belonging to a race. Islam is not a racial categorization of people. But uh, the the point is, they use whatever they want to use in Whatever order to works. shut us down and, and so that they can advance forward, right? Right. And so it doesn't make any difference whether, I mean, they'll tell you that Islam has nothing to do with race and then call it a person who's a critical, critical of Islam to be a racist. But why? Because it's, it's the most vile word they can use in public. If they were on the street, they'd be using another word. All right. So let's go back a bit again. This is interesting. I mean, a little bit later, I definitely want to talk about the application of much of this today you know, what is happening in, in, in the West right now with all these attacks we're seeing and all these kinds of things. But let's back up a bit more. Talk about this aspect of the, uh, you know, what they call the golden age, basically. We have, we've had the, the yes. classical world collapse. There's been tremendous uh, murders and bloodshed uh, to get to this point, right? And mm -hmm. what we're getting through the, uh, the university environment, cultural Marxists, uh, you know, there are professors, academics, they tell us what a wonderful time this was, specifically in Spain, you know, in, in, in uh, uh, Andalus and, and, and this period. Uh, yes. Tell us about this. What, what, what was, what's the reality here? Well, in the year 711, Tariq invaded Spain, the Visigoth kingdom from uh, North Africa. Now then, we're told by the academy that this was a high point of European civilization. I've even seen academy types even be so remorseful that Islam, the most beautiful civilization, was driven out of Spain and it was turned over to those ugly Catholics. And by the way, I've touched a little bit on the secret of the propaganda about the Golden Age in Spain, which is people, by criticizing the Spaniards, were criticizing the Catholics. And this had to do with some arguments about Catholicism in, in France. So, but the Golden Age, I have a question for you. If it was so wonderful in Spain, explain one thing to me. Why did the Spaniards fight for seven centuries to drive them out? Because they were, they were, because they were racists, of course. Oh, they were racist. I see. <laughs> they didn't want the uh, they didn't want to be humiliated, so they're a racist. That's but right. But we do have to say that. Uh, and and by the way, there's another thing about the Golden Age, which is the uns the flip side of the Golden Age, which is how the 
ignorant, stupid Europeans, the white people were living in caves and eating dirt. It was the dark ages and they just couldn't cut it. We need to not only talk about the golden age, but we need to explain a little bit about the dark ages in Europe. And that is this. Uh, the, we think of, when we think of Muslims, we think of desert, at least in the early Muslims, and we think of camels. But the truth of the matter is, Islam projected power across the Mediterranean immediately after breaking out of uh, Arabia after Muhammad died. Now then, the Mediterranean is the civilization. When we think of civilizations today, we think of Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, North America, South America, or whatever. We think of continents. We think of bodies of land. But the truth of the matter is that this world in Europe and Africa and the Middle East was a Mediterranean culture. It was You could get from Alexandria, Egypt to Rome in two weeks' time in a boat. I think I'm right on that, maybe 10 days. But to go from Alexandria to Nigeria, which is sub-Saharan Africa, could take years. So therefore, even Egypt was part of the Mediterranean culture. North Africa was part of the Mediterranean culture. But the jihad of the ocean, the piracy, closed down the Christian trade. Archaeology, there's a wonderful book uh, written. It's a 1,400-page backbreaker. But it's called The Rise of the European Economy. And it's based all on archaeology. One of the most interesting things is, is when Islam ruled the Mediterranean, 90% of the Christian ships didn't do any business. That is, the basically you can tell how many ships were sailing. There's a certain percentage that are going to be sunk. Well, it turns out that when the, Mediter when the Mediterranean was ruled by the Muslims, Christian ships weren't sunk because they weren't sailing. Now then, papyrus was cut off from being sold from Egypt to Europe. Now imagine that you and I suddenly woke up in the morning, Henrik, and there was no paper. And there was no telephone. There was no way to communicate. And that all the traffic into our town was reduced to 90% of, only to only 10% of what it was. So the trucks that, and the planes and the trains that bring in produce and other goods to be sold in commerce, 90% of them don't get here. What do you think that's going to do to the economy? What do you think that's going to do to education? The internet's down. The phones don't work. So we would have in our own life a dark age, not because we're stupid, but because we simply aren't allowed to do business. So there's two sides to the golden age. It created the dark ages, which makes the golden age look even more elevated. Do you follow my reasoning? Yeah. Here? Yeah. But there's another point. We've also established from the Sirah that when the, when the Muslims burst out of Arabia, the first book written in classical Arabic was the Quran. These were not a lettered, skillful people. It is said that the Muslims preserved historical documents of the Greeks and Romans. First off, they didn't need to be uh, uh, saved. They were already being saved in the Byzantine world. But let's accept that they were. They were translated into Arabic, not by Muslims, but by Jews, Christians, and they were translated into Persian by the Zoroastrians. This only makes sense. And by the way, this is not a put down of the Muslims at all. They had to learn from somebody, and so they learned from their servants, the Demi Christians and the Demi Jews. So all of the glorious work that was the Golden Age, for instance, you read about all oh, the Muslims, they had such wonderful hospitals and medical care. Those were run by Christians and Jews. The bulk of the Islamic training during the Golden Age was all about Sharia. The work on other things was done by Christians and Jews primarily. Now, the other thing that the Golden Age looks so golden is, is that today we think an Arab is a Muslim. Well, hello. In Damascus, they were Arabs and they were not Muslims. So, therefore, the Christians and the Jews did a lot of the translation work, did a lot of the thinking work, now, and they had Arabic names. I've seen Christians with Arabic names be touted as one of the Golden Age scholars. Well, they were a Golden Age scholar, but they were Christian. They were not Muslim. So the whole business of the Golden Age is uh, overrated. And I must mention a book which has been written in here, The Myth of Andalusian Paradise by a Spaniard, Spanish scholar, Dario Fernandez Maria. I'm sure I fractured the pronunciation. It is a book which deals with the Golden Age in Andalus 
and how it was a farce. This was yeah. Arabic supremacy and Moorish supremacy. By the way, I, I don't want to talk about something here. When we read the history of the invasion of Islam, it always uses ethnic terms. The Turks, the Moors, the Arabs, the Saracens. They don't call them Muslims. The world has always tried to suppress any knowledge about Islam and tried to pretend like, oh, they're okay. This process we're seeing in Europe now is 1,400 years old. Yeah, this is interesting, you know, because one of the things, when I was reading it around a bit here, you're talking about the, the targeting of, of Jews in many areas, you know, around in, uh, in the Mediterranean, in parts of Europe, and all these kinds of things. And I, I was always been very interested in this question about the Visigoths. You know, there's... Uh, yes. We we know that they move down further down into Europe. There's parts here, of course, where they are get they get the uh, they get attributed to sacking the Rome. And I know you have a different theory on that. We can talk about that too. But one of the things I want to get to here is that I've come across so many sources that talks about the wonderful relationship between the Jews and the uh, Muslims, specifically in Spain. You know, the golden age of how Jewish culture well, thrived let's, in let's, Spain, and it goes on and on. Let me interrupt you here. Ton, let me yeah, interrupt you ahead, here. But any invader finds it very useful to have people who are the natives working on his side against their old enemies. When America was invaded by the white man, they could always find a local Indian tribe who was willing to work with them against their old enemies. Well, there was tension between the Jews and the Christians in Spain before the Muslims invaded. And so what the Muslims did was they put the Jews in charge of business. That is, you're working with us. So there is a reason why it worked out better for the Jews. Also, the Jews did not have any land to conquer. So, so at the time, the they, did. they considered the Visigoths a bigger threat than, than the Muslims. Well, before, the, the Visigoths had, their, had a very different form of Christianity. It was Aryan Christianity. It was unlike Catholic Christianity. For reasons which I do not understand, there was tension between the uh, Aryan Christians, the Visigoths, and the Jews. So the Muslims exploited this to their own advantage. Now then, if we want to talk about the uh, wonderful golden age for Jews in Spain, we need to understand that the Jews lived in their own ghettos. Maybe the word shouldn't be ghetto, but their own isolated areas, the Christians in theirs and the Muslims in theirs. So this was not some happy set of suburbs where David invites Dawood over for a barbecue. No, no, no. They had their own separate parts of town and did their own separate business. And there were times in which there were riots and Jews were exiled and Jews were killed. There was at least 5,000 in one riot. Let us summarize the relationship between the Jews and the Arabs or the Moors in Spain with Maimonides. Maimonides lived about 800. And in his book written to the Yemen, a letter written to the Yemeni Jews, he gives the following advice. No culture has ever abused us like that of the Saracen. They have never humiliated us and ground us into the dirt like the Saracen has. You can, for instance, teach a Christian the Torah, but never attempt to teach a Muslim the Torah. So here's one of the greatest Jewish scholars who ever lived giving advice to fellow Jews in Yemeni, in Yemen rather, and saying, do not try to interact in these religious ways with, with Muslims, but you can with Christians. So the story is much more mixed than we would like to talk about. And also remember, this is a seven-century history. The United States yeah, has only right. been a nation for two centuries. Right, exactly. No, that, that's true because, you know, I've been reading about how some of the the gates to some of the cities in Toledo and in Cordoba and all these places were, were opened. And I've read this on Jewish sources themselves because, they, as you said, they had a bigger problem at the time with the, with the Visigoths. Uh, and, and then afterwards, you... You know, it takes Spain, as you say, or the Spaniards, about 700 years to clear clear this problem out. And what happened in, in go all the way up to 1492, when they take care of this problem, uh, I believe that the Catholics at that time boots out both people, right? They boot out the Jews and they boot out uh, the Muslims as well. And they try to regain control over their nation again. But they have always been blamed for that. I even saw a news story, uh, it's over probably six months ago now, how all of Spain basically repented and and. Uh, they, they were forgiving, you know, that they've done these horrible acts, both against Jews to help to open that helped to open the gates, and then also to, you know, the Muslims, obviously. So they ha were forced to grant citizenship to a, a ton of of Jews and things like this. It's very strange how this history has been twisted, and it always is spun in such a way that it's used against the the European. 
This is true. This is true. But the, the history is, has been rife with politics for a long time. Uh, like I say, uh, Voltaire used the Muslim invasion of Spain to his own advantage to denigrate the Christians. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a remarkable story. It's a bloody story. We, there, there are so many aspects here I want to get closer to. One one thing before we move ahead too too far is it kind of a side note to all of this, really, but it's funny. Have you heard about what the Kaaba actually is? I've heard that there was a meteoric rock in there that actually yes, it is. is worshipped. Is that what it is? Yeah. I know a little bit about this. There was more than one Kaaba in Arabia. There were a total of six, these cubic buildings, and they had inside, there was a door, and inside there were various ritual items. Some people would call them idols. There were paintings, and they were, the, they were the, basically the city center, and they were a pilgrimage circle. Uh, so, uh, they, people, it was common amongst the pagans even though they had different gods to have a common worship and it involved doing prayers while they circumambulated around the Kaaba. Kaaba is just an Arabic word, I believe, for cube, and it is a cubic building. Muhammad did not invent as much as he adapted, and so he adapted the Kaaba to the worship of, his, of, to the worship of Allah. Now today, all prayer is done in the direction of the Kaaba, and by the way, there is a black stone in the Kaaba in Mecca. The other five, we don't have any, I don't know where they were. But then it is a meteorite, and it's set in a silver holding, and it's in the corner, and Muslims kiss it and touch it. Uh, there's a, before Muhammad, there was a lot of worship of stones. And so, interestingly enough, we see that taken over into Islam today. Now, the, one of the things that's interesting, although every Muslim today prays in the direction of Mecca, for the first 200 years, they did not pray in the direction of Mecca, but instead uh, prayed in the direction of Palmyra, which was a Neo Neobatian. I think I've said that wrong, but roughly that Neo. I can't say it. Uh, but anyway, they point in the direction of Palmyra, not Mecca, and then it changed, which is an interesting thing within itself. Why would the direction of prayer change? And uh, why did? It, but it originally was to Palmyra, hmm. not to the right. Meccan. Interesting. So something has have changed along the way. Has there been any reforma updates? I mean, if we look at the Catholic Church, you know, after it becomes you know approved by Constantine and and these kinds of things, it it goes through various ecumenical councils and things like this. How does that work in Islam? Is there updates, renewals, or interpretations yes, and things like that? Yes, yeah. there are. What we remember what the word reform means. What Americans think reform means is oh, everybody gets warm and fuzzy and doesn't insist on doctrine. Every, we're all going to, can we all get along here? That's what we mean by reform, so that can we stop all this silly argument about religion? But reform means to go back to the foundations, to go back to the beginning. And that's what happened with reform in Christianity was, is that the centuries and millennia of acculturation are just layers of cultural things laid on to, to Catholicism had no basis in the Bible. So that's how Protestantism came about was it went back to the original sources and said the church should be more like this. Well, that's done several times in the 20th century. We've had many reform movements. The Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and Islamic State are all reform movements. What they do is they go back have you ever read Dabiq, uh, which is the magazine from Islamic State? No, I haven't. It is a fascinating read if you're into the doctrine of Islam. They go through in excruciating detail. For instance, they were talking about sex slaves. They say, people are criticizing us for taking sex slaves. But look, here in the Quran, it advocates sex slaves. Here in the Hadith, we find sex slaves. Here in the Sirah, we find sex slaves. Matter of fact, I learned something from the reading Dabiq magazine, which was only one companion of Muhammad did not have a sex slave. So therefore, the point I'm making here is, is that Islamic State is a reform movement going back to the original status of Muhammad and, and the Quran in which sex slaves, that is captured kafirs, can be used for pleasure and sex. It is your right as a jihadi to have that. The point I'm making here is, is that Dabiq magazine is filled with theological arguments 
about how Islamic State is pure Islam. And I agree with them. Islamic State is the purest Islam that you can find. Now, tell us. So it is a reformation. Yeah, interesting. We'll talk more about that in a second. Tell us, though, about the history of this. Many people don't know about the incredible amounts of both sex slaves from Europe into the harems and all these kinds of things, but just oh. slaves in general from Europe. Well, let's go back to Spain. The first thousand sex slaves that were taken out of Spain to North Africa, the Muslims were stunned. They had never seen such beautiful women. And as a matter of fact, they decided that they would make a specialty of blonde women. And there was a standing work order or purchase order or whatever that in Baghdad, they were to deliver this many blonde virgins, Christian, they didn't care whether they were Christian or not, blonde virgins for the harems of Islam. Now, by the way, when we see, I remember, you can see old paintings of the harems, and this is pre-Playboy and pre-porn on the net, and these are alluring sexual photographs of women in gauzy outfits, and they're softly erotic. Hello, those women were all captured slaves, and they were forced into sex. There is nothing romantic about a sex slave. Nope. And yet nope. this was a this was a centuries old business run out of Spain for the pleasure of the Arabs in the Middle East. Yeah, it's incredible. And we never hear uh we never hear about that. You know, we never that's never recognized. It's almost like the the attitudes is that Europe was only the oppressor, we were never the the victim, <laughs> you know. Well, if you study Islam, you'll discover that everyone is the victim. That's the theme of the Quran. Let's define jihad, what that, what that is and what that means. It was some of the terms I wanted to go through here so people know uh, what, what these things are. First off, let's be clear. Jihad does not mean war. Jihad does not mean holy war. Jihad means struggle. Harb, H-A-R-B, is war. Jihad is struggle. Struggle can manifest along many avenues. It can be the struggle of the sword. It can be the struggle of writing. It can be the struggle of uh, speaking and the struggle of money. There is a lot of verses in the Quran that talk about how that if you don't want to be a jihadi, you need to be giving money to those who do want to be a jihadi because you get an equal share of the business. That is the reward, the spiritual reward. So money, giving money can be part of jihad. Uh, Muhammad used money to buy the hearts of those who were weak. And by the way, in American politics, uh, Hillary Clinton received around $20 million, or the Clinton Foundation did, from the Saudis. And the Saudi king told the princes they were to pony up $20 million to the Clinton Foundation, and it was to be held as part of the, the zakat, the tax. One of the uses of the charity tax is to strengthen the hearts of those who are weak. In short, a bribe. So jihad can be done with money as well, a very powerful and useful form of jihad. Jihad is a, Islam is enormously practical. It works. It works and works well. And the whole concept of jihad works and works well because it means that you can practice jihad by writing a letter to the editor. You can practice jihad by assuring someone at work that you're a Muslim and you know that Islam is the religion of peace. Oh, of course. Naturally. So, of course. <laughs> so tell us a bit, uh, Bill, here before we take a break about uh, obviously, the website politicalislam.com, but I know that you're, uh, you, you told me before we started here that you're updating many of your books. Yes. Uh, t tell us more about them and how, how, how many you have and, and where you'd recommend people to begin uh, if they want to get into your work. Well, actually, let's, I do have a website, politicalislam.com, and I have written and put together study courses. One of the study courses is The Foundations of Islam. It's a series of four little books. And that, by the way, they're deliberately small because when I wrote big books, people didn't want to buy them. Then I wrote a political pamphlet of about 60 pages on Sharia law, of which I've sold about 60,000 copies of. What I discovered is people will read little bitty books, but they won't read big books. So I've put together a self-study course called The Foundations of Islam, in which you have a little bitty Quran, only 80 pages long, a little bitty Life of Muhammad, a little bitty Hadith, and a little bitty set of lectures that guide you through the whole thing. So I'm, in, I'm, a, I'm a college professor, retired, and so one of the things I love to do is teach. And so one of the things I've done is I've put together the first self-study courses. And, he says proudly, in a month's time we're going to announce the first web-based training on political Islam that's ever existed. 
Very good. So there's like a four level uh, <laughs> steps here, basically, that people yes. can get into uh, yes. that breaks things down on some of these concepts. Because, yeah, I mean, I've heard, I've heard that for, for years, too, in terms of I, mean, I haven't read uh, the entire Quran. I've read passages. I've read, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, try to get things, you know, understood from a better perspective. Some people claim, well, you got to read this version or this or blah, 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 whatever. But what you've done there is obviously to kind of break down these concepts and give them in an easy way for people who don't have the time to sift, sift through the Quran, you know, for themselves, right? I have published three different Qurans, and the title of the big one is called A Simple Quran. And anyone can sit down and read this book. Or you can, if you want to, there's an abridged version, which has only half as thick because the Quran is infinitely re repetitive. But my Qurans are easy to read because I've restored the story. And maybe in the next segment, we could even talk a little bit about how I did that. Yeah, certainly. That, that's uh, definitely a good idea. Much more I want to ask you about, and, and we're only just kind of really getting started here. A lot of things to discuss, but uh, politicalislam.com, folks, that's the, uh, the website. Just click on the bookstore if you want to find out more about the books. Is there anything else, by the way, you have upcoming, any uh, speeches or anything like that that people should uh, know about? Well, actually, I'm going to your home, Europe. I'm going to be there in October. I have an organization which I run in uh, in Central Europe. So I'll be taking that trip soon. Oh, great. So uh, is there any uh, speeches there that people can catch you at or uh, anything, well, any inf the, information on that? Well, we haven't planned yet? any big public speeches. This time, actually, what I would like to do when I go is to meet with government members and university officials. Yeah, if they will, uh, if they will meet with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, Central Europe is very different from the rest of Europe. Remember, I go to Poland, Hungary, S Slovakia, and Czech. Poland is good. These were yeah. all under the boot heel of the Soviets, and they've known tyranny. My audiences in America are older. My audiences in Central Europe are under the age of thirty-five. Oh, great! Yeah, that's great. Yeah, a lot of things, uh, inspiring things, are brew brewing. You call it Central Europe, but I call it Eastern Europe. But I get your point. <laughs> well, they they told me it was Central Europe. <laughs> yeah, because because at one time you used to you know Constantinople used to be the eastern edge of of Europe at one point, you know. Right. Uh, but that's not how we view it today. All right, uh, Bill, stay with us here. We'll just take a short break, and then we'll be back with much more in a second. Stay with us, ladies and gentlemen. Well, the second hour is coming right up after a short break. Please go to Red Ice members.com and sign up for a membership with us to continue to listen to this show and get full access to our archives. It's uh, packed full of radio shows, videos, and our live TV show. We'll uh, begin to talk about the reasons for the crusades in the second hour and go from there. Much more to get into with Dr. Bill Warner. Thank you for listening. We'll be right back after the break. All the basis we need to know about Islam is found in the statement of the Shahada, which is, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. That tells us that we need to study Allah, which is the Quran. Now, oddly enough, when we study the Quran, which is where the average person thinks Islam is found, we discover that there's not enough in the Quran to be a Muslim. I mean, you cannot be a Muslim because not a single one of the five pillars of Islam is found in its entirety in how to do it in the Quran. But... The Quran gives us a way out, and that way out is found in the fact that there are 91 verses in the Quran which state that Muhammad, she is the perfect pattern for all people, and that all men are to follow, and women are to follow him in every way into the smallest detail. So even the Quran takes and points to Muhammad. And so he, if we're going to understand Muhammad, to understand Islam, we need to understand Muhammad. Now, yeah. This is good news. Because the Quran is famous for not being able to be read or understood. But Muhammad, we've got a man. He has a history, a personal life. We can understand that he gets hungry. We can understand that he has sex. We can understand he becomes angry. So we're dealing with someone we can well understand. Now, having said that, we need to first examine Muhammad's life and see that it, 
his life as a prophet breaks down into two separate different people. He preached the religion of Islam in Mecca for 13 years and persuaded roughly 150 Arabs to become Muslims, about 10 a year. He left Mecca at the insistence of the Meccans. They actually ran him out of town. And when he went to Medina, so Muhammad was driven out of Mecca. He didn't leave on his own. And when he went to Mecca, he transformed into a politician and a jihadist. Now, this is not something that I'm making up or it's some sort of slander or put down. This is clearly, clearly recorded in the Sirah, the life of Muhammad. Now, here's what's important. He was involved in many assassinations. As a matter of fact, he had roughly, an, a, he, there was roughly a jihad event on the average of about every five to six weeks for the last nine years of his life. But by the practice of jihad and politics, he became completely saturated. They, everyone in the area around the central Arabia became a Muslim. So we have here the preacher who was a failure, but the politician jihadist was an absolute success. So therefore we get an insight then into Islam. It is the religion of peace and it is the politics of jihad. Why do we know this? Because that's what Muhammad's life is like. And there are 91 verses in the Quran which say that his life is to be endlessly repeated until every human being becomes a Muslim. Amazing. What do we know about, obviously we know in Persia you had Zoro Zoroastrianism, mm -hmm. but, in, but in the area that he was, uh, you know, early in his life, what kind of religion, was there a religion there that we know of? Just there were pagans, I guess, <laughs> believed in multiple well, gods? There were, or? there were pagans. Well, from the Sarah, we learn all this information. <clears throat> We learn that, for instance, there were pagans, uh, and then there were Jews, and there were Christians. Now, in the town of Medina, we have reference to Christians. As a matter of fact, there's a Christian slave who appears in the Quran, in which it is said, we know that they're saying that you get your information from this man who is not an Arab, but this, era, this Quran is written in perfect Arabic. Well, Muhammad used to spend a lot of time talking to a Christian slave in the marketplace, and so the Meccan said, ah, oh, see, he's getting this stuff from them. So know from the Sirah that there were references to Christians, but mostly pagans. Now, interestingly enough, Muhammad made his money as a caravan superintendent. That is, he knew the caravan trade. So he raided after, it took eight tries to get it, but he became successful when he raided one of the caravans uh, from Mecca. Now then, 80% of the booty went to the raiders. 20% went to Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Well, now then he had a religion with a politics that paid money, good money, big money. And so, as Osama bin Laden said, people love a strong horse. Well, all of a sudden, Muhammad became a strong horse, and he became, attracted more people. His violence also attracted people. Now, this is hard for people to understand. But in America, after 9-11, September 11th, 2001, the attack on the World Trade Centers, many people converted to Islam. Let me tell you a small story that comes from the Sirah, the life of Muhammad. Muhammad, and I forget at which stage of this of cleaning out the Jews, said, kill every Jew you can lay your hands on. And this one man killed his business partner. And his brother approached him and says, how can you have done this? You have killed the man who put the fat on your belly. He said, Muhammad said to kill him. The brother looked at the other brother and said, you mean if Muhammad said to kill me, you would kill me? He said, yes, I would. The brother said, this is a marvelous thing. I must become a Muslim. So here, the fact that his brother would kill him was an indication of he wanted to become a Muslim too. So this had to do, so the success was political power, prestige, being a winner is always a good thing, and money was to be made. So this became a very successful piece of business, and it was indeed business. Muhammad made jihad a business. Interesting. So we have a situation here where it, where it expands, I mean, incredibly rapidly. I don't know if we've seen anything like it. Can you kind of give us an overview of, of how it expands, in, in what direction? And Because you did a couple of presentations of basically the, on the classical world, and mm -hmm. in a very similar situation, I have to say, uh, almost after, like today, like after the Second World War, the way we have been weakened and, and, and now we're seeing a, a change in, in the demographics in Europe particularly. But at the time, uh, there was 
massive battles between the the Greeks and the Persians, and this seemed to have weakened them at that time. Yes. And that's when they strike and move in. Tell us more about that. Well, first off, it was established that Muhammad was successful through jihad. It was jihad that made him successful. Now, by the way, just a brief sidebar, and we can deal more with this later. Jihad is practiced with the sword. It is practiced with the mouth, the pen, and money. So any, you can advance the cause of Islam through jihad, but not just by killing people. So, Muhammad was successful, and once he had conquered, if you will, all of the tribes around Medina, he then struck out north to go into Syria. Now, this was not the first time that he had left Medina to seek out people to, to conquer. He had done this before with the Jews of Kaibar. But anyway, after, so after Muhammad has crushed the Jews and the pagans, he then goes north into Syria. Now, what happens is soon after this, Muhammad dies, but he has already demonstrated his power for expansion. The fact is, every knee must bend and every mouth must say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. So therefore, when Muhammad died, the first person who became caliph, and you can think of caliph as a ruler, which is like a pope, king, that's a rough Ladies and gents, I'm Henrik, and this is Red Ice Radio with headquarters in Sweden and in North America. If you're new to the program, take a look at redice.tv for more radio shows, news, videos, and excerpts from our live TV show. Today we're talking about the history of Islam and the life of Muhammad. Our guest is Dr. Bill Warner from politicalislam.com. Bill holds a PhD in physics and math from North Carolina State University. He's been a university professor, businessman, and applied physicists. Now, Dr. Warner has had a lifelong interest in religion and its effects on history. He studied the uh, source texts of the major religions for decades. Now, if you're a regular listener of the show, you might not agree with uh, you know, Bill's views on 9-11 or some of the things such as who lobbies to open the borders or controls the school textbooks, etc. But the history part is a very interesting aspect that I think is very important to consider. So, uh, as usual, please don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. You have officially received a trigger warning. I mean, from our globalist friends and the mainstream media who back them, it's clear that with increasing immigration, we are not being told the truth about the history between Islam and Europe. You know, there were hundreds and hundreds of attacks on Europe before the Crusades were brought together. And they're telling us that this is a religion of peace, while we see terrorism, both on a large scale, but also on a very small scale, individual attacks. All of this is on the rise around in the countries that have open borders, and they're asking you to perform the noble task of double think and ignore this reality in front of you. So we are going to talk about the history of this today and help you get some of the terms defined, such as Sharia, Jihad, the Jiza, the Sunnah, and much more. So stay tuned. I hope you get something out of this discussion. Welcome, Dr. Bill Warner. Thank you so much for coming on with us. It's a pleasure to have you here. Delighted to be here. Well, this is great. You know, we, we discuss a lot on the show about the problem with, uh, with Islam, particularly in Europe, but also in America. We discuss the, the attacks, the consequences of having open borders and, and not checking first and foremost who is coming in, uh, as, as is occurring now during the, the so-called migrant crisis. But one of the things that I do want to try to get closer to today and, and kind of when we have you here to, to pick your brain, really, because we have so much knowledge about this is to get to the origin point of, of Islam. We don't get too much opportunity to discuss this. So out the gates here, maybe you can tell us a bit about the life of Muhammad, what you know about this, I guess what we know academically about this, and how all of this mess that we find ourselves in today, how this got started. Well, let's establish that there are two Muhammads. There is Muhammad whose biography we know in the Sirah and whose acts and deeds we know in the Hadith. So there is that Muhammad. Then there is a historical Muhammad, and all of a sudden, if we deal with historical Muhammad, Muhammad, we're on very shaky grounds, because it turns out that his biography was written about roughly 150 years after he died. So let's not deal with the aspect of the historical Muhammad, but instead let's deal with the, shall I say, the accepted Muhammad, 
the one that every Muslim believes in. And we have, you'll notice we're talking there about Muhammad, not Allah, but all the pay were polytheist pagans, and there were, it was said, 360 different religions that were found in the Kaaba. That is the central temple or the central spiritual site within Mecca. 360 religions were found there. The point is, is that polytheists are inherently tolerant. So we know that there were many tolerant pagans or polytheists in Mecca. We know there were some Christians, but we know that there weren't any Jews. How do we know that? Because when you read the Quran written in Mecca, and there are two Qurans that match his life. There's the early Quran written in Mecca and the latter Quran written in Medina. And they're very different books. When we read the early Quran written in Mecca, we find that it retells all of the stories of the Jews, but they're slightly changed. The story of Noah and Moses and Adam are all retold to point out that if you do not believe the prophet of Allah, you will be destroyed. Now, here's what happened about him and the Jews in Arabia, which was this. When he went to Mac Medina, the town was half Jewish. The Jews look at Muhammad, who claimed to be the prophet in the same prophetic lineage as the Jewish prophets, and said, you are no prophet in the Jewish lineage. Well, no one told Muhammad no, at least permanently. Two years later, Medina was Judenrein, cleansed of Jews. The three Jewish tribes were exiled, annihilated, enslaved, and assassinated. So, Therefore, I'm giving you the question was, what about the religions of, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula? And what we find is, if we read the Sirah, we find that there were some Christians, there were some Jews, and there were many polytheists. Now then, briefly, in the early Quran, Mecca, the Jews are well spoken of. But in Medina, once they told him that he was not the prophet, not at least of their lineage, the, told, the whole tone became, changes. And indeed, the Quran written in Medina is viciously Jew hatred. I've read Mein Kampf, and indeed there's more Jew hatred in the Quran written in Medina than there is in Mein Kampf. It's both, it's just <laughs> much worse, both in quantity and quality. So that's interesting. So something happened. Do you know if he actually was born of a Jewish mother? So was he uh, technically Jewish? You know, I don't know about that. Can't speak. All right, interesting. Well, let me ask you a bit more of what actually, what happened. And why, I mean, I, I'm not saying that the religion, religion was accepted. We're talking about force here, but you're saying he converted about 10 people a year, right? We we're talking about an enclave of, of about 150 people in the beginning. Yes. How, how did this expand? How did this explode? Well, the, the expansion way? came, <laughs> the expansion comes. And by the way, this story of Muhammad should be made into a movie. Uh, it, it is a fascinating story, and I'm not being ironic. The man is born, an, is born, becomes an orphan, and rises up to being the first ruler of a united Arabia. I mean, it's a fabulous story, but unfortunately it's not well known. And why did we go from 150 to total saturation that it was every Arab becomes a Muslim? Because he had a new method in which you could worship a god and make money. You see, for a long time, for the first year when Muhammad was in Mecca, the Muslims were very poor. Now, he had a score to settle in Mecca. Number one, they had thrown him out of town and made him look bad. They humiliated him. And the other was they had money and he had none. Now, remember, Muhammad analogy, but it's a spiritual leader and a religious and a political leader. We currently have a caliph again today, of course, in Islamic State. But the first caliph was named Abu Bakr, and he was Muhammad's closest companion and was his father-in-law. Now, the first thing that happened when Muhammad died was, is that there were many people who said, you know, it was kind of nice being a Muslim. We've liked working with Muhammad, but Muhammad is dead now, so we're on our way. Goodbye. Thank you a lot. And uh, Abu Bakr said, no, no, no. You're a Muslim. No one ever leaves being a Muslim. And the Rita Wars or the apostasy wars were fought. What happened was, is that the military might crushed all of those Arabians who wanted to cease being a Muslim. After that happened for a while, the rest of the Muslims said, you know, we've thought about it and we rather, we really rather like being Muslims. And so therefore we're just going to let the whole issue die. We were, we're now Muslims and there's no more fighting to be done. Then Abu Bakr 
turned his attention to Syria. Now, soon after this, he dies. He is succeeded by the caliph by Umar. And under Umar, we see a massive explosion of Islam into the Middle East and in North Africa. It was an incredibly rapid expansion, also into Persia. And all of these fell. Now, there were reasons for their falling, but one of which was that both the, the Greeks, the Byzantines, as we call them now, but really they were the, what they call themselves were the, was the Romans. They had been fighting the Persians since for a long time. So both sides were weakened, and so they were easy to crush. Now then, this, this power is consolidated, but we have to understand that what happens is that the heart of the Middle East, Damascus was the intellectual powerhouse of the Christian community. It was taken. And now then, all of these Christians were now under the rule of Islam, and they became dhimmis, D-H-I-M-M-I-S, which were people who could live within Islam. This is the tolerance of Islam. They could live within Islam, but they couldn't practice their religion openly. And at first, of course, they ran the empire for the Muslims, because remember, when they came out of the desert, the first book written in classical Arabic was the Quran. So these were not skilled men. Their architecture consisted of mud brick. So all of the grandeur and glory of the Middle East and the Greek and Persian culture was taken over by them and run by them by the Persians and Christians who became dhimmis and ran the empire for them, collected taxes and gave them the money. So they didn't kill them all, but they did set into the place the Sharia, which means that the Christians could be humiliated, the Jews could be humiliated, and the Zoroastrians could be humiliated as well as taxed. So they became high-class slaves or third-class citizens, except the third-class citizens business, they weren't really citizens. They couldn't testify in court. There were many obstructions to uh, being a full, they were subjects. So that's a brief story about the military expansion of Islam. Now, what's interesting here is, is that it never falls back. What do you mean? That is, one, that is here's something to notice about Islam. There are post-communist societies. There are post-Nazi societies. But you don't really find post-Islamic societies, except with a possible place in Spain where they fought for 700 years to throw them out. Right. This is a very interesting thing.